This meeting is being recorded. Welcome to Hudson Valley Uncensored. My name is Brett Freeman. I'm your host. Uh, and today we have a very special guest. We have Senator Pete Harcum uh, with the 40th uh, Senate District in the state of New York. Uh, and Senator Pete Harcum, he's been our state senator since 2018, correct me if I'm wrong, and um, he represents uh, several different towns in the Hudson Valley. Um, he represents uh, the towns of Beekman, Pauling, and the village of Pauling and Duchess. He represents Carmel, Patterson, and Southeast, and uh, the village of Brewster in Putnam County. And he represents the city of Peekskill, the towns of Cortland, Lewisboro, Mount Pleasant, Newcastle, North Salem, Pound Ridge, Somers, and Yorktown, the town village of Mount Kisco, and the villages of Briarcliff Manor, Buchanan, Croton on Hudson, Pleasantville, and Sleepy Hollow in Westchester County. At least for now, I know things are getting redistricted. redistricted so, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but Senator Pete Harkin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. And, and we also, and thank you for being on. We have um, also our editors, Brian Marshauser, Tom Malagorski, and Bob Dumas. They're the editors of our the newspapers that we publish. Uh, we publish Mayapac News, the Somers Record, Yorktown News, North Salem News, and the Katona Lewisboro Times. And uh, I, I'm going to launch right into our first question. Um, and it's really, it's, it's about bail reform. I know that's kind of a big topic on, on people's sure. minds. Um, I, I realize that actually bail reform's intent was to make the system more equitable. Um, you know, most people agreed that people shouldn't languish in jail to, to, due to economic reasons. Um, but I know there's been some pushback um, from uh, people in law enforcement um, and, you know, other government officials and uh, just, you know, people in general in, in, in New York State. Um, I have uh, former uh, Judge Salagonia, former Yorktown Justice Salagonia, um, he, he had said to us, the one person who knows best as to what the status of the defendant is at an arraignment is the judge. Why? Because he's, he has in front of him or, um, or her a rap sheet, uh, which tells how many times a person's failed to appear in court, how many times they've been arrested for crimes, what the status of the crime is, a felony, a violent felony, or a misdemeanor, and all that has to be considered when you consider bail. Um, and when you put some, that some kind of formula to it that's artificial, it makes it a lot harder for judges. Um, so I am, you know, curious if you have, what, what your thoughts are on bail reform, whether the reform needs to be reformed. Sure, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot to this discussion um, because there's, there is kind of the noise and the perception and then, and then there are the figures that we get from, from the state. First of all, there, there's no question in our major cities, our urban centers, we have a spike in violent crime. And that's all across the nation, whether it's democratically led, Republican led, bail reform, no bail reform, that, that's a national trend dealing with the pandemic, the easy access to guns, uh, unemployment of tens of thousands of young men um, with really no clear direction or path forward. When, when we look at bail reform, you, you outlined it very well in the beginning that, that it, was, it was unfair that if two people are accused of the same crime, just because one could pay to get out on bail and another would languish in jail, um, and usually those were people of color, uh, and, and they would lose their jobs, lose their apartments, lose access to their kids. It was a grossly unfair system, so we needed to change it. The first version of bail reform was done in the former governor's budget. It was not perfect. I was one of the people who led the fight to revise the first um, bail law. And we did, we added more crimes. We gave judges much more leeway, especially into repeat offenders. Um, but when you look at the numbers between reoffenders out on bail and reoffenders out on their own recognizance, it's very interesting. More people out on bail are reoffending than more people out on their own recognizance. And part of that is because the people out on their own recognizance are accused of nonviolent offenses and folks out on bail could be accused of violent offenders, offenses. So it's, it's about 30% to 20%. That, that's a very interesting number. The other thing is if you look at gun crimes in New York State, only 1% of people who were let out without bail, only 1% of those were somehow involved in a crime involving a gun. So, you know, we continue to look at this, you know, there's discussion about um, whether judges should have a dangerousness standard. The problem with that is the courts in New York 
unlike other places in the country, have ruled that that they can't use a, a dangerousness standard because that is racially biased. So if there are ways that we can tweak this, we are certainly open to. Um, but really what we need to do is address the root causes of violence. It's the easy proliferation of guns. It's 10 years of the former administration starving our behavioral health system and our mental health system. You know, these ghastly assaults on the subway. You know, those are folks who should be in hospitals, uh, not roaming the subways, uh, harming themselves or, or other folks. And we look at, you know, where we live, what makes our community safe, those social determinants. We have great schools with robust after school programs. We have uh, access to employment, great transportation, great health care, world class health care. So these are the determinants of, social, of, of, of safe communities. And these are the supports that we need to help uh, other communities have so they can be safe as well. All right. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate the comprehensive answer. Uh, Brian, I'm going to jump to you. Well, oh, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll get right into uh, the, the issue from the last couple of weeks. I know um, your bill uh, regarding ADUs was accessory dwelling units was included in uh, Governor, Governor Kathy Hochul's budget. And obviously, you know, local legislators kind of pushed back on that. And I think now that the governor's taken it out of her budget. And I, I know you've been speaking with local, uh, you know, supervisors and mayors in your area uh, about this legislation. So can you tell me the latest on that and, and what, you know, what your, what, how these discussions have gone and, and what kind of changes you might make to your bill? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a good question, a timely question. And for your viewers who don't know, accessory dwelling units mm -hmm. are, are quote unquote, um, mother-in-law flats, granny flats, uh, attic apartments, garage apartments, basement apartments. And, and the, the reason we, 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 we addressed it this way, you know, ADUs are, can be one of the tools in the toolkit of creating affordable housing in, in a low impact way. And the reason that, that we need to do this, and, and the statistics clearly show that our housing units are not keeping pace with the number of jobs we're creating. So when you have a limited supply and demand outstrips that basic economics, the prices go up. So what's happened is our seniors on fixed incomes can't afford to stay in their homes. Our young people can't afford to move back to the communities they grew up in. Our workforce uh, cannot afford to live in the towns in which they work. So they have extraordinarily long commutes. So if you ask a, a dental hygienist or a vet tech, uh, in your community where they live, odds are they're going to say they live in Dutchess or Orange County because they can't afford to live in Northern Westchester. And finally, our emergency first responders, who we know are all volunteers in our communities, they're always desperate for new volunteers because folks can't afford to live in the community. So accessory dwelling units were um, are, are kind of a low impact way uh, to address that situation. Um, there was there was a lot of buzz. You're right when the governor put it in the budget. Now that it's out of the budget, we we have a you know there's there's no time crunch. You know if it takes a year to get this right, we'll take a year to get it right. So all along we've been meeting with supervisors. Last year we met with Westchester municipal officials. Um, we made about a dozen changes in the revised bill at their request. Um, and then just last Monday I met with 16 mayors and supervisors. This was right before. The governor took it out of her budget. Um, we got some more suggestions. So, you know, the, the good news is there, there's no time crunch right now. You know, the important thing is to get it right as opposed to getting it done right now. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the things that we're talking about, because many of the communities in Northern Westchester, like Yorktown and Bedford and North Castle, uh, Lewisboro, actually have good ADU laws. And so, you know, we could grandfather them. You know, we're not looking to punish folks who have good laws that are working, what we wanna do is make this toolkit available uh, as a low impact way, you know, because it's very hard up our way to get large scale affordable housing done. We don't have the infrastructure. There's a lot of NIMBY pushback. So mm -hmm. it's just another tool in the toolkit that we can use. I have a number of ADUs in, in, in my own neighborhood where I live. Uh, they fit in, you know, perfectly with the character of the homes in, in which they're in. Um, so, Again, low impact way to do this, but we want to get it right. And we'll continue to work with local officials mm -hmm. to, to craft something that gives them the kind of controls they feel they need. 
And, and do you think this may end up looking something like the model ordinance regarding affordable housing in, that a lot of these Westchester communities have adopted in the sense that, you know, it, if they already have an ADU law on their in their own local code, um, you know, will there be some kind of model ADU law uh, that, that you're going to hope they adopt or want to you know, require them to adopt something like that? Well, you know, originally that was that was what we were looking at in, in the first two versions of the bill. I, I think, you know, as we move forward and we'll continue to speak with municipalities is is many of them who don't have laws say we don't mind doing this. We think it's a good idea but let us craft it in a way that works for our <clears throat> municipality. So yeah. I think that's the way we'll be going. We'll be looking at incentives. As you know, the governor put $85 million in the budget in the five-year housing plan. So that money is not going away. So if we get something done next year, that money will still be there. Um, so, so, you know, we'll be looking at incentives as well as um, kind of a minimal floor that, that municipalities need to, need to, to meet. Okay, great. Anybody else got a question on this? Well, I, I mean, I, I'll have a comment. I mean, personally, I actually, <laughs> I, I actually think ADUs are, um, um, I think it's a great idea. I mean, uh, two, two of the four of us, uh, of, of the four people interviewing here today, um, we actually uh, moved over to, to Fairfield uh, County. I um, mean, I live in Fairfield County, and it, it was definitely a little bit more affordable for us um, to, to live here. Um, you know, my, my property taxes are probably half of what they would be if I lived in Westchester. Um, so, um, you know, but when I look at the ADU law, you know, that's something that could have probably enticed me to stay in inside Westchester, um, you know, to be able to, to make some income as a, as a landlord, possible landlord. So, um, you know, yeah, that, that's, that I think, you know, and I think probably it seems, it seems like maybe just the, the objections are really, uh, um, you know, about people trying to control, keep a, keep a local control over, uh, over the law. But I think overall, I think it's a great idea. So I live in one. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. There we go. Yeah. There we go. So, um, hey, uh, Tom, I'm going to let you uh, go next. Okay. Uh, Senator, good to, good to see you again. I don't know if uh, you remember when you arrived on the scene, I was working at the newspaper up in Pauling. So yes, was, uh, <laughs> yes, good to see you again. Yeah, likewise. So yeah, it was nice to see what, yeah, what I got hooked up at in uh, North Salem and Somers. I'm like, all right, still get, still get Senator Harkum. So uh, anyway, so I wanted to talk a little bit about your work you know, as the uh, the chairman of the Committee of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse. And uh, I also wanted to like, really applaud you um, just for all the work that you do. This is kind of an issue that uh, I, I lost somebody very close to me to uh, um, uh, opioid overdose a couple of years ago. Right. So I've seen, you know, for no, but, um, you know, I know that uh, it, I've seen firsthand how it, you know, how it affects families and everything. So I, I really applaud the work that you do. And um, you had a you had a big year last year. I mean, you had 16 bills signed into law. And that was, you know, something that we kind of followed closely in my publications. And uh, I was just kind of curious, like, what's, you know, what's next for your work with that? And um, just maybe your thoughts on the, you know, the you know, marijuana being legal in the state of New York now and how that's going to affect everything. You know, I know the opioid overdoses, uh, you know, especially during the pandemic, you know, those numbers were up and that's, you know, that's kind of like a scary statistic. Yeah, the, the, the numbers are at historic highs um, and, and, and every death, one death is, is, is too many, you know, and it's a combination of factors. It's, a, it's the stressors of the pandemic, the isolation, the economic dislocation, the loss of loved ones, um, all those stressors and strains are having people medicate or go back to self-medication and fentanyl is poisoning the, the, the drug supply, you know, so years ago, you know, you might have, you might have a few hundred people die of an overdose, but because of fentanyl, now it's hundred, you know, it's a hundred thousand in the United States. So that, that's a big part of it. So, you know, a lot of this is about harm reduction, you know, naloxone training, getting folks into treatment. The good news is this year, um, thanks to Attorney General Tish James and, and some of the pharma settlements, um, there was that opioid stewardship fund uh, that was created a few years ago, and we have money from the federal government. Oasis's budget is increasing by half a billion dollars this year. Um, you know, you never see that with any state agency. So the budget's going up 56% new money for harm reduction, new money for workforce retention. We have a workforce crisis. Um, you know, before I spoke about how the last 10 years, the human resources sector had been starved in New York State um, and, and they can't re recruit and retain qualified staff 
because folks can make more working in fast food rather than dealing with, with our most vulnerable patients. So there's money to, to support the workforce. You know, I travel all over the state meeting um, providers and the last three I went to, they were at 40% of their census, not because of COVID restrictions, but because of um, uh, workforce shortages. So we need to address the workforce shortage. And then on the recovery side, we need more supports in terms of things like transportation uh, for folks to have a more holistic recovery experience, not just getting to a treatment appointment, but to a job, grocery shopping, drop their kids at childcare, um, all these things that contribute as well as safe and supportive housing. We've had no regulation in New York State about recovery houses and the governor's put my bill in her budget that for the first time will set standards and rate begin to regulate recovery houses to provide safe places for folks in early recovery to live and then transition back. So we've got a lot to do still. You know, is oh, that, there, is there's, that... there, there is, there's a lot of elements to this too. And you know, I, I think the housing is, you know, that's gonna be a big part of it too, just having some kind of regulation there. Yeah, because some of them are, are very, very good. You know, there's a terrific one in your town with a lot of peer support and a lot of therapeutic support. Um, they're hooked up with jobs and therapy in the community. And others are just horrendous flop houses where drug use is rampant uh, and people, people, it's a more dangerous environment than they let. So that's why we need to regulate uh, recovery housing. Does that also include zoning, the, the regulation? Well, right, right now, you know, we, we would not be looking to do anything from a zoning perspective. What we would be looking to do is set, set standards for the recovery houses that exist. Um, you know, what makes, what makes a safe and successful recovery house? If you meet these standards, you will be certified by New York State. So therefore, um, uh, uh, families and patients will we'll know that at least it's met a minimal threshold mm. of safety that they can feel confident sending their loved one there. Right. Like I, I remember I'm, I'm pretty well versed in this because in Yorktown, they had a whole big you know, one you were just referencing where for years, you know, they, they tried to get this thing built. And it was, I, I think the, the building inspector made the determination to that it was going to be reviewed under as a convalescent home in Yorktown's code. But, you know, that didn't really speak to the you know, the counseling, the experience of the, the people running the place. And I know, unfortunately, somebody did die uh, at the place at a drug overdose. Uh, then it changed hands, new ownership. But um, yeah, you know, it, 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 you know, that that's it. So it's an interesting topic for sure. Yeah, but I think I think at this juncture, you know, the state not venture, we wouldn't be doing something like a Padavan law as, as we do for yeah, yeah. homes for people with disabilities. This is more to set standards of excellence for the ones that exist mm -hmm. or ones okay. that may want to exist, but they, they, you know, all those still need to go through their local zoning process. Okay. Yeah. Senator. Yeah. Oh, Sorry, Bob. Yeah, please, yeah. please. Um, yeah, that data has shown that in the States where cannabis has been legalized, we've seen a precipitous drop in the opioid use and overdoses. And uh, are you hoping to see the same thing here in New York? Um, and how far away are we uh, before the infrastructure for dispensaries and that sort of thing takes hold? Yeah. Well, I, I think we're still a couple of years away from dispensaries. Um, they're just beginning to promulgate the rules. The, the Cannabis Oversight Board, the statewide board has been seated. They're starting to promulgate the rules. Um, I, know, I know there are people in the business world who are beginning to look at the grow facilities, where can they find real estate? Um, usually uh, what a lot of them are looking at are old warehouses that have been defunct and they retrofit them. So I think we're a couple of years away. Um, you know, part of the thinking that went into the legalization in New York, um, you know, I, I share my experience, you know, I've said before, I'm in long term recovery myself, I don't advocate people use any substance that's, that's mood altering, but people choose to do that on their own. Um, and so legalizing marijuana wasn't so much about creating a new marketplace, it was about taking an illegal marketplace making it legal and taxing it and using that revenue for public good. So some of that money, that tax money will go to Oasis. Uh, some of that tax money will go to 
um, economic redevelopment efforts in communities that were impacted by the war on drugs. And a good chunk of that money will just go to education in the general fund. So that's where the money is gonna go. I think, I think we're probably um, well over a year, if not two from uh, seeing dispensaries. You know, we do have medical dispensaries and those can begin to expand. Um, under the new regulations, uh, but but I think in terms of adult use, personal use, we're a year or two away. I, I believe we have until um, eleven ten. If uh, let me know if, if if I'm incorrect about that. Um, but um, I'm, I'm good on time. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so um, I guess Brian, if I, I'll go back to you, if you have any questions, questions you'd like to ask. Uh, you know, I, I was just going to ask more like on the on the local level, I was, we're seeing a lot of big box retailers kind of go out of business, move to new towns, and they're leaving behind these big vacancies. And I've spoken to many building and planning officials in my towns who are all struggling, or who say they're all saying the same thing. They're struggling to find, uh, you know, retailers to move into these spaces. Uh, you know, is, so can you kind of talk to me about the state of, you know, economy in New York and, and what can be done about this? Is, is it just the market conditions right now? You know, there's just retailers are just, you know, not, not looking for big spaces anymore. Well, it's, it's a combination of a couple of things, you know, there, first there are the, the mom and pop stores on main street. Mm -hmm. And we, we've done a tremendous amount during the pandemic to, to, to help these businesses. We created in the last budget an $800 million grant fund so this is above and beyond all the federal programs, the direct grant program from New York State. Actually, it was based on my law um, to support these small businesses. In the budget negotiations now, we're looking to replenish that fund so that our small businesses are getting the kind of support they need. But one of the things that we know, and, and you know, this is just me speaking as an observer, um, if we want to support our Main Street businesses, we need foot traffic. You know, and and that that's that's housing. You know, you need to have people who live um, near where these stores are so they can walk. Because we're now in an age where where you don't have to hop in a car to do anything. You know, you can get your groceries delivered um, with with the delivery services. You can get flowers delivered. You can get all this stuff delivered. Or there's the 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 Amazons of the world and the big box stores. So the big footprints. Um, are, are not necessarily needed in the retail space the way they were. So, you know, there are a couple of things you can do with them. Some of them are turning them into kind of entertainment venues. Um, you know, we saw uh, in, in Mount Kisco, there's a very successful example of that. The old AMP warehouse is now, it's a, it's a racetrack, it's a bowling alley, it's a gym. Um, you know, so so what are alternative uses for the big retail spaces? And I think I think also now with COVID easing, you know, hopefully we will see more people coming back. You know, our our malls, you know, like the Jefferson Valley Mall saw a precipitous drop in traffic during COVID. And and hopefully folks will come back and start to patronize mm -hmm. those folks. But I think as our economy changes, retail has fundamentally changed. You know, I think we can we can still um, save kind of our mom and pops on main streets and our local restaurants. Um, but I think some of that big retail that we were used to seeing may be changing to a degree. And, and we've got to find a way to change with it. Yeah, it looks like in our towns, um, I know the, the Kmart building in Yorktown and then the Home Goods building in Somers, uh, you know, it looks like the 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 landlords there, the property owners there are looking to uh, convert those into kind of mixed use buildings um, with a lot of apartments. Um, you know, I know the car gets back to um, you know, housing, affordable housing, but I, I mean, I think a lot of people conflate rental with affordable. I, I think I'd like, you know, I'd like to see a lot of some of those be a little more affordable, but uh, you know, as someone who was just shopping for apartments and saw like $3,000 a month rentals around here. Yeah. yeah so. Their definition of affordable is a little different than ours. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and, yeah. You know, it, it, there, there, there's like affordable, which is a federal government yeah, affordable, yeah. like, you know, from 40 to 80% of area median income. And then there's just what, what we generally term is more affordable, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the marketplace. And to me, that that's one of the appealing things about accessory dwelling units is because they're much smaller, mm -hmm. they're, they're naturally going to be less expensive. They don't have to be regulated in, in the kind of 
you know, fair housing way of pricing, you know, obviously anything that's rented has to be done uh, through fair housing standards. But, um, you know, if you're if you're getting a six or seven hundred foot studio above someone's mm -hmm. garage, it's going to be a heck of a lot less expensive than a two bedroom apartment in a complex somewhere in, in Westchester. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, anybody else got some questions? Tom? Uh, no, I think I'm good. I, uh, yeah, my, my focus was really just on the, um, the, uh, the opioid stuff. So, and, uh, also, I mean, I know this, this will be broadcast last year, but, uh, actually, um, uh, Senator, you're going to be in Somers on Saturday for a food drive benefiting St. Luke's, uh, food pantry. So always, uh, always good to have you there. Appreciate that. Oh, we'll thanks, have some thank you for the for plug. You. you know, we have done, we've done 12 of the, this will be our 12th one. And mm -hmm. one of the unfortunate byproducts of the pandemic was it exposed the great food insecurity in our communities. You know, we think of Northern Westchester as an affluent place, but food insecurity was always present and the pandemic um, has really exacerbated that. So, you know, we this will be our 12th one throughout the district. The communities, um, wherever we go, have been very, very generous. Uh, and, and we thank folks for that. And we hope people will come out on Saturday to join us at the food drive. Well, I have some questions. If Great, I can, Bob. I'm Please. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, a couple of things I wanted to talk to you about, Senator. Um, uh, and this is uh, an ongoing one regarding our utility companies, NYSEG, mm -hmm. where I am in Con Ed. And yep. as, as you know, we just, you know, uh, did some stories about people being off, caught off guard with these huge electrical yep. bills. And you proposed some legislation that would help people learn about this ahead of time, you know, so that they wouldn't be caught off guard, which is all well and good. But NYSEG has also um, put on the table proposed rate increases. The town of Carmel town board just sent a letter to the public service commissioner opposing these saying, with all the service we've been getting with all these power outages and um, basically terrible service, how can they possibly ask for a rate increase? It just seems outrageous. Um, but I and talked we, we to just, Supervisor went... Kadari, who said, yeah, we're sending this letter. It's probably fruitless, but we feel like we got to do something and we don't know what else to do at this point. So, um, Yeah, well, the legislation that we're drafting, it's actually in bill drafting right now, would do two things. One, that, you know, because utilities buy the power in advance. So if they know there's going to be mm -hmm. a commodities related price spike to their consumers, they, they need to give them a 30 day heads up that it's coming. And then the other thing they need to do is have an easy way, you know, some kind of a check off where the consumer can amortize that cost over 12 months. So they're not getting, you know, a $600 whack as some of our constituents did, at least if they they're getting that commodity pricing passed on to them, they can at least amortize that over the, the course of 12 months. I, I have a follow-up question. I mean, I know, I mean, looking at Indian Point, and, um, and I don't know, know the exact status of, of that right now, um, but I know it's either, either set to close or it's going to, uh, or it has closed. Oh, um, it's, it, it closed. Yeah, last, okay. last year, the decommissioning okay. process has begun. But um, I mean, my understanding of nuclear energy is it, it actually is clean energy. I mean, it, um, so I'm, I mean, in hindsight, is there? I mean, I mean, why was that closed? I mean, is it is you know, uh, was it a mistake to close it? Um, I mean, was it that particular facility, or is it was it because of nuclear energy? Um, you know, I'm I'm curious to your thoughts on that. Yeah, it was a combination of a couple of things. Um, one was energy is getting out of the nuclear business. They, they're closing their entire nuclear portfolio. Uh, part of it is because they wanted a new water permit um, that would have sucked millions of gallons of water from the Hudson River. Um, and so uh, there was litigation with New York State DEC and a number of environmental groups were contesting that new water permit. So that would have um, dragged on in litigation for years. Um, and, you know, frankly, I, I, I thought the, the location was problematic to have a nuclear plant, you know, in the midst of a region with 20 million people. Um, but, but, you know, so Entergy made the decision to close. Holtec is now uh, doing the decommissioning work. One of the things that we did 
um, last year as we negotiated with former governor to create a decommissioning oversight board of local elected officials, statewide elected officials, relevant state agencies um, to actually oversee the decommissioning because while its purview is in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, um, quite frankly, nobody really trusts the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and they've already announced that they're they're weakening um, their their protocols for decommissioning and their oversight, and they're not even going to have a resident inspector on site. So fortunately, we have this decommissioning oversight board. We don't have full sway over the activities, but we meet quarterly. Um, and, and we, we do have uh, the ability to take action if something unsafe is going on. But we hear from community members about the pipeline. We hear from parents concerned about what may happen. You know, are there going to be negative impacts on the kids in the schools? Um, so it's, it's a good forum uh, to, to, on a quarterly basis, discuss this these issues both with the community and with the decommissioning entities. I mean, is there any future in New York State for nuclear power? Do you, do you, yeah. you know, I, I, I personally um, don't oppose it. You know, there, there is um, discussion nationally, but the challenge with nuclear power is we have no place to, um, to get rid of the fuel. So for instance, the village of Buchanan will be a nuclear waste repository in perpetuity unless the federal government thinks of a way to, you know, remember they wanted to do Yucca Mountain a few decades ago, uh -huh. and that never came to fruition. So when we talk about trying to, um, once Holtec decommissions uh, the plant, what that means is all of the buildings will be gone. Essentially, they return that to a vacant lot. There are one or two buildings that are going to leave up. Um, but if somebody wants to do economic development there, you know, you've got this pristine spot on the Hudson River, but, you know, is, is a hotel marina complex going to go in there when you have 125 spent casks, you know, sitting on the property? So that becomes a challenge as to what we do with the spent fuel. Yeah. Uh, Bob, you so just, there, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to follow up because because there, there are always questions about, you know, the power and, and where that's coming from. Um, there are two proposals of, of cables to come, come down the Hudson. One would be um, uh, clean energy from upstate New York, and the other would be hydropower from Canada. And both of those are proposed to come down the Hudson and hook up in New York City, um, which would help then take some of the dirtier power plants in New York City offline. So we're getting clean energy and improving the air at the same time. Uh, Bob, you had some extra questions? Yeah, just uh, one other thing, Senator, I wanted to touch on. And yeah. um, and Brett mentioned it at the outset of the program um, about redistricting, because um, he went over what your current district includes. And of course, um, if things move forward, that's going to change. And some, you know, call it redistricting, a lot of people call it gerrymandering. Um, and it seems like whatever political party is in power um, in both both major parties have done it, ha, ha, you know, control, kind of control it and can kind of redistrict it as they see fit that might benefit them. And I think we're seeing some of that now. Your district, the one that uh, you'd be in charge of, would change dramatically. And I think, Brian, you mentioned before we went on air, like uh, some of the strange bedfellows this is going to make for, for Senator Harkin's district. What did you say? No, I was, I was saying the new congressional district in Yorktown, oh, you know, it run from Yorktown to Co-op City. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was. Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, state. you know, yeah. the congressional uh, districts were were a different animal, yeah. you know, with 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 our districts you know, it was, it was limited by the numbers, right? You follow the numbers, all districts have to be the same size. We needed to add two new Senate districts in New York City because the population shifted uh, from upstate to downstate. So we added two new districts in the city. So that pushed everything out. So for instance, my district is shifting from the 40th district to the 42nd district because of those two new districts down in the city. So my district will not change too much in terms of demographics. So we would be losing um, uh, Pauling and Beekman. 
but we would be gaining um, Kent and uh, Putt Valley in Putnam County. So that's kind of a wash. And then the, the other way it will change is my district currently goes down the sawmill with Mount Kisco, Newcastle, and Mount Pleasant. So the new district, instead of going down the sawmill, I would lose those three communities. It would go down Route 22, mm. and I would pick up Bedford, North Castle, and White Plains. So, you know, it's really kind of a wash as far as my district goes. Um, you know, Bedford, I have to drive through the town of Bedford every day to get to anywhere else in my district. So, you know, it, it's kind of natural geographically that that would fit in, in there. I lived there for 20 years, represented at Bedford for eight years on the county board. So I know those folks very, very well. Um, so it was really about, you know, in our district's case, just kind of following the population and working within the confines of the population and the lines being pushed up from New York City. I do have, um, I guess, one additional question also. I, I, and, um, you know, I don't know the, the specific details of this, but I know it came out and it was kind of a controversial move um, with, um, with COVID therapeutics um, that I guess one of the criteria um, in, included race um, as, you know, who, I guess, who gets, um, if, who gets uh, the therapeutics first if you had to uh, ration it. Um, so I was curious at what your thoughts are on that. You know, am I mistaken there with that or, you know, that was, that was a, a statement that the health commissioner made, uh, the new New York state health commissioner made, um, you know, her, her point was that, um, as we saw and as kind of factually ac accurate, both in New York and across the country, COVID disproportionately impacted black and brown communities. Um, so I think she's trying to make the point that those communities would not be forgotten. You know, it, the, 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 the good news is there is no shortage of the therapeutics. There will be no rationing. Um, you know, that was not a policy of the legislature. Um, but I, I think it was, it was an expression of the health commissioner to say these communities, um, you know, we're not going to forget you this time. So, but there, there is no rationing there. There's plenty of medication. Knockwood, you know, let's let's keep hoping the numbers trend downward and folks stay healthy, um, and 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 that's not going to be an issue. But but we've been told there there are plenty of of supply to go around New York State. Great, All right, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your time today on our show. And thanks for um, having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you have any questions for us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I I just want to thank you. You know, I think I think. Um, these dialogues are important and, and community newspapers are so important um, because you're actually covering the news that really impacts folks' lives. And, and we know just how much noise there is on social media coming from both sides of the spectrum. And, and so community newspapers, letting folks know what's going on in their communities is just so valuable and important. And, and I really want to thank you for all the work you do. Well, I appreciate that. You're definitely preaching to the choir here about that. And, uh, you know, I definitely, uh, you know, I appreciate your comments on that. So thank you very much. Thank and you, thanks for having yeah, me. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Nice seeing you again. All right. Great to see everybody. Thank Take you. Take care. Thanks a lot. Thanks. thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. All right. So everyone, I guess I'd be curious uh, to, you know, hear your thoughts on the interview and, uh, and, um, you know, um, I think that, well, well, I didn't think that we were really going to go into any kind of controversial <laughs> topics or anything. I mean, it seemed, uh, seemed good. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, no, one, no one's ever going to accuse him of not being prepared. I think uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, these exactly. are all well rehearsed answers for sure. <laughs> yeah, he had his facts on his side. I mean, yeah, he, 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 I'm sure he's answered these questions many times before, but at the same time, I think it was still useful because we don't cover the state. Uh, as close as we cover our own town. So I, I think it's always recording good. recording right here, Brett? Yeah, we're still recording. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. No, I, I think it's uh, I think it's always good to, um, you know, hear, hear from our state legislators. I think that, you know, they used to, yeah, yeah. Before, before these meetings went virtual, I know they would come by our town board meetings a lot and, uh, you know, give some quarterly updates or whatnot. But it's always good to hear from our state legislators. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep, and Bob? I think you revealed some interesting things there that a lot of people 
probably don't know or don't want to know, like especially about um, Entergy and the nuclear power mm -hmm. plant, that it was like there. A lot of people think, oh, it was you know the governor or the Democrats or the environmentalists that closed the plant. Entergy, the company that owns it themselves, made the decision to do it. Like he said, they're getting out of the nuclear power business, so um, there was a lot of factors. And I, I don't think a lot of people realize that. So that was interesting. And then his discussion and explanation of gerrymandering. Um, I thought was was interesting uh, how he explained how it's based on demographic. Yeah. Well, I spoke with uh, Assemblyman Burdick, who represents uh, Bedford, Lewisboro, that area, a while back about this. There's a website you can go on, nyirc.gov, and you can look at the existing maps, and then you can look at the proposed maps. And basically, I know it, it's, a, it's a population shift, like he's saying. Um, and I know people upstate never love hearing that because uh, a lot of the population shifts downstate. So they lose kind of more control, you know, they lose more representation in the legislature. But I think looking at the map now, they says the average district population is 320,000. And so they're trying to get them all around kind of in that range. Each district that have about 320,000 people. Uh, the 40th right now has 307. So they're actually 13,000 short. So they're, tr they're trying to shift things around and get them all kind of equitable. I think that's the goal, but it's how these maps are drawn. That are you talking about congressional districts? Are you talking no, about no, no. I'm looking at the Senate right now and yeah. the assembly. It's uh, you can look at the state lower house. The average district in, in the lower house um, is about 134. Now, is so that is that is that a New York State constitutional requirement or I no? Know, like, I don't. I mean, I don't think so. I think, but I I, I think yeah. the whole point being they want they want equitable representation in the legislature. Yeah, meaning that these towns that lost thousands of people should not have the same voting powers cities that gain thousands of people. So yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, I know that's the whole concept, I guess, with, um, 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 when, when, um, states lose congressional districts, um, in, in electoral college yeah. votes, it's, 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 no, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a fun that. exercise. If you actually go on these maps and you can click through and like, I'm, I'm clicking on, um, Assembly District 118 up around Utica, you know, they're, they're 8,000 short of what a, a normal assembly district has. So I guess a lot of people moved out of there and Oswego County, they're 5,000 people short. So I guess, you know, there's a, there's a migration down and, you know, migration down, down state for sure. Well, it's sort of how some people feel about the United States Senate and like every state gets two senators, no matter how big they are. So like North Dakota has two senators, California has two senators, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Population. Right. Yeah. You have Texas versus Rhode Island, but everybody gets the same amount. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the so, whole purpose is also to, to protect minority rights. And you also look at some states are, are um, more like agri agricultural states. So, you know, you, you do want to protect um, you know, kind of the, it, it, it's, it's not just about de democracy. It's also about protecting, um, you know, protecting states that do have lesser populations by giving them a voice. I mean, that, that was the whole reasoning. I mean, if you just, if you read the Federalist Papers, that, that's sort of the whole reason behind that. So anyway, gentlemen, appreciate your participation today. That was a good Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Yeah, no, this, good one, yeah. this was a good get. Nice, nice change up from this, just yapping uh, yep. to each other every week. So, Thank you yeah, before, before we go, so as far as the early deadlines go, do you want the specs? Let me, let me, I'm going to stop recording right now. Okay. All right.